Sports Line with Steve Lehman rolling on here on News Channel 5 Plus. Oftentimes, the week ahead of Super Bowl week can be quiet by new standards in the NFL. That was certainly not the case today. Tom Brady officially announcing his retirement. And then this afternoon, the bombshell lawsuit filed in a Manhattan federal court by former Dolphins head coach Brian Flores alleging discrimination in the hiring and firing practices within the NFL. And we're joined now by Aaron Solomon, the chief legal analyst for Esquire Digital. Aaron, thanks for taking the time tonight to join us and, and sort through everything that I think is going to be a pretty stick sticky legal situation for the NFL and, and the courts to try to figure out. Thanks for having me, and I think that we're going to be talking about this for a long time. Yeah, so let's get into it. And for our audience, I want to go down just some of the things that Flores alleged in the lawsuit, again, he's seeking class action status, and in it he said that while employed by the Dolphins, owner Stephen Ross attempted to incentivize him to, first off, try to recruit a prominent quarterback, which would probably violate the NFL's tampering rules, or so Flores thought, and so he tried to stay away from that situation. And then later on, tried to monetarily incentivize him with $100,000 for every loss as the team hoped to potentially tank for the number one pick. Again, Flores did not do that, and he said essentially because of that, he was labeled within the organization as non-compliant or difficult to work with, which may very well have led to his firing at the end of the season, despite the fact that the team won eight of their final nine games. He also alleges in the suit two other things that have to do with the interview process and the Rooney rule within the NFL. The first one comes from this year when he said that his interview with the Giants for their head coaching vacancy was essentially just a sham, that it had already been given to Brian Dable of the Bills and that he's got text messages from his former boss, Bill Belichick, in New England that says as much, and that by the time he interviewed, the job was already essentially handed out, and he was just there to fill the quota minority status interview position. And he said also that back in 2019, he had a similar experience with the Broncos, where he actually alleges that John Elway and others from the Broncos organization showed up seemingly hung over, alleging that they'd been drinking the night before. I don't know how he's going to prove that exactly, but as he gets into this, did I summarize that fairly well, Aaron? What, what else stood out to you from the claims that were put forth in the court today? You summarized it beautifully. In fact, it sounded like a Mexican telenovela, which <laughs> is really what this whole thing is like. Let's be honest. The Rooney Rule, which is 20 years old, is there so that NFL teams can check a box and say that they've complied with the Rooney Rule. What it was supposed to do is give us more black and other minority coaches in the NFL, and right now we don't have them. <laughs> so Brian Flores, in bringing this class action, is really stepping forward as the next Colin Kaepernick. He realizes that after this lawsuit, he's not going to get a job in the NFL selling peanuts in the stands. His career is over. So he's risking it all on this case, and the kinds of things that are going to come up in discovery are exactly what you're talking about. There's going to be a lot more text messages, not just the Bill Belichick ones, which, by the way, it's remarkable. He thought, Belichick thought that he was texting Brian Dable, the Buffalo Bills coach who ended up getting the Giants job two days Hold on, Aaron. Floor is even interviewed. Hold on, Aaron, real quick, because there's been a lot of speculation about this. The way I read that this afternoon is I actually thought that he knew he was talking to Brian Flores, but he thought that his communications with other teams was leading him to believe that the Brian that they were talking about getting the job was Flores until he went back to double check and realized it was Dable. I, I, that was my understanding of it. Not that he thought he was talking to a different person, that he got the two confused while talking to the other teams. I'm not sure that even matters a whole lot in this situation, but it does paint the picture a little bit differently. 
Yeah, it could. I mean, I'm looking at the text messages right now, and that's absolutely one very valid reading of it. When he talks about congrats, you've landed. And then, then, then Flores says, Coach, are you talking to Brian Flores or Brian Jable? Just making sure. And then he says that he messed up the whole thing. Nonetheless, all of these kinds of text messages, including, by the way, messages that aren't necessarily directly relevant to Flores, all of the John Gruden messages... And we only found out very, very little about that during the season. These are all going to be discoverable in a class action about this kind of stuff. Yeah. So as this moves forward, how does this exactly work? And what do you think uh, Flores' biggest hurdle is in trying to get this to go forward? So, you know, you've got to hit the NFL where they live. And that's always been money. So this is going to be a very contentious and very expensive lawsuit, and it's not going to be something that settles quickly. The NFL would like nothing more than to settle this thing ideally out of court and quickly as possible. But again, it's going to be really the same situation as Kaepernick. You've got someone, as I said, who's not going to be able to work in the league again. And if he, as he said, and this is actually out of his own mouth today, Flora said, God had gifted me with a special talent to coach the game of football, but the need for change is bigger than my personal goals. Yep. So if he really is looking at this lawsuit this altruistically, then he's going to be all in, and the legal machination, machinations are going to take over, and this thing is going to take months, if not years, for the courts to finally put teeth in the Rooney Rule and ensure that we're not just checking boxes, but we're actually getting black and other minority head coaches in a percentage closer to the percentage of black players in the league. Yeah, Flores went on to say in making the decision to file the class action complaint today, I understand that I may be risking coaching in the game that I love and that has done so much for my family and me, but my sincere hope is that by standing up against systematic racism in the NFL, others will join me to ensure that positive change is made for generations to come. Here's my question to you, Aaron, about this, and I do think you're right that by filing the lawsuit, if it goes forward and there isn't a settlement, that there will be a lot of things that come out in discovery that will paint this picture much more clear. But up front, how does he prove that race was the factor in him either getting fired by the Dolphins or not getting these other jobs? It's pretty clear that there's some stuff going on there, like Brian Dable got hired by the guy he worked with with Buffalo, Joe Schoen. Joe Schoen's a first-time GM who knows one of the hot coaching candidates out there, and he interviews him, and it, it wouldn't shock me if he said, that's our guy. I'd have to be blown away for anything else to happen. Brian Dable is going to be our, our head coach. That wouldn't shock me, and that would technically be against the Rooney rule within the NFL which could be a problem, I think, for maybe a draft pick or something with the Giants. But how does Flores prove that that is actual systemic racism against him in getting the job or anything that Stephen Ross did in Miami with systemic racism and why he lost his job? What Flores is going to do is point at the history from that, between now and 2003, even before that, of the black coaches who were passed up for jobs. Just the, here's a sample of a few names that are out there in the coaching market this year. Eric Bieniemy, Brian Lef Byron Rufflich, Lovey Smith, David Culley. There are some great head coaching candidates who are only getting interviews to check off the Rooney Rule box. So Flores doesn't just have to prove that, you know, he was fired for this reason or he wasn't hired for this reason. It is systemic because what the NFL does is they have white owners who are hiring white coaches. And there's a history of all of these other coaches who haven't gotten the jobs. So it's not something new. You've got decades of evidence to bring to the court and show this is the way the NFL runs their operations. We're talking with Aaron Solomon, chief legal analyst from Esquire Digital, all about the Brian Flores suit today. One of the things he says that he wants to do, or really the uh, the objectives as he wants to do in here, is obviously he wants to increase the influence of black individuals in the hiring process. But then he says... He wants to increase the objectivity of hiring or terminating GMs, head coaches, or coordinators. How do you do that, Aaron? Well, again, what the court will do, let's, let's imagine this thing progresses and the lawyers are bringing evidence to the court. What the lawyers are going to show is very simple. 
black head coaches don't get the same runway that white head coaches do. There is no way that NFL metrics would show that if Brian Flores was a white coach, that after his record, also dealing with a fairly mediocre quarterback in Tua, that he'd be gone by now. And the way you do is you, what you do is you look back and you look at all of these coaches and their coaching records and you see how long their tenure was. This is going to be a very metrics driven lawsuit. It's not going to be about opinion. So I'm staring at the list of all the black coaches in the NFL since 2000. And I, I think it's, I mean, the, the problem I think is going to be in this is that it's going to be subjective on the objective nature you're talking about. Because if you look at these guys, and there's about 20 of them here or so, you know, Tony Dungy's obvious that he's a great coach. He also never got fired. He won a Super Bowl. Jim Caldwell's a good candidate, I think, for your case. He has a above 500 record at two stops, made multiple playoff appearances, and got fired in both jobs. There aren't a lot of other great cases out there. Lovey Smith probably shouldn't have gotten fired from the Bears. He absolutely probably deserved to get fired from the Bucks. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you go down and down the list. Romeo Cornell has a winning record in Cleveland, but was terrible towards the end, and he was awful in Kansas City. Uh, Mike Singletary was awful in San Francisco. Hugh Jackson was atrocious in Cleveland. Uh, those yeah. are some of the guys that come out. I mean, two of the guys you just named as great candidates right now David Culley just went 4-13. and 13. You know, like, I think that guy might get fired regardless of the color he is there. And that, I think, is going to be the challenge, don't you? Is like, how do you, how do you look at some of the records of these guys and what they did? And different organizations have different metrics, obviously. You know, the Browns have hired, fired a lot of coaches that never won anything. And then there's other coaches. The Titans fired Mike Malarkey a few years ago after he won nine games and went to the playoffs. So hiring and firing is by its very nature a subjective thing in the NFL. I just feel like it's going to be a challenge to prove an objective thing from a subjective question. You're right. I agree totally. This is going to be a long, drawn-out process. But remember the NFL's own words. The NFL says diversity is core to everything we do. And there are a few issues on which our clubs and our internal leadership teams spend more time. Yep. This isn't just going to be incumbent upon Flores to show that he was ill-treated. It's also going to be incumbent in a legal court of law on the National Football League to prove that they're following their own policies and that there is not systemic racism. There's lots of evidence of systemic racism in the league. And when it comes to coaching, part of that systemic racism is that the league itself isn't preparing a lot of these assistants for a long tenure as an NFL head coach. That's one of the other things he says is he wants to increase the coordinators and, and some of that. And I think some of the most effective things the NFL has done has been its lower level apprenticeship programs and, and uh, training camp assistants that are added in to try to get some of these guys who are maybe former players a chance to get their foot in the door and perhaps create a career for themselves in that regard. But obviously it has not had the impact that people would hope because when the Rooney Rule went in, there were three black NFL coaches. There's now one plus Ron yeah. Rivera, who's also a minority at, you know, a Hispanic minority in the NFL. And one and of the Robert other things. Yeah, Robert Sala as, as well. In, incentivizing hiring and retention also, again, I don't know how you do that. I mean, what do you what do? You, do? you give a draft pick to a team for making one of these hires? Uh, again, I, I'm struggling with some of the goals here because I think in an altruistic way, we want it to be as fair as possible, right? We want everybody who's deserving to have an interview and have an equal footing and the best candidate to win. But I don't know if the aims uh, that I see in this lawsuit make it any more likely that that's going to happen. No, you see, I, I think that the time has passed for the NFL to be incentivized with carrots for following what the Rooney Rule is supposed to do. And I think it's time for sticks now. So I actually have my own simple proposal in a piece that is out for publication. And it's very, very simple. 
what the court needs to do is say the league needs to have a certain percentage of new hires to be black and other minority head coaches. And for each percentage point each year that the league mi misses, there's going to be a fine on the league and those teams that hits the league where they don't like to get hit, which is in the pocketbook. This is a very, very profitable league. We have to remember the NFL does not run like a charity, right? The NFL makes a lot of money. So we've tried the best we can to get the NFL to cooperate with their own rules. And I think now it's time to find the league and find teams who are only out there checking boxes if Flores can prove in a court of law and the class can prove in a court of law that that's what's been happening. Yeah, and I mean, I, that's obviously going to be the challenge, is how do you prove that the Giants didn't hire their best candidate or that that was the guy that they wanted all along? So where's that fine go? Oh, believe me, there's lots of things that NFL charities could do with that fine. I think let it go to their own charities. NFL has sure. a 501c3 charity, and it can do lots of good in all of the communities where these 32 NFL teams reside. And the last thing I want to say on this issue is, by the way, I'm a huge Buffalo Bills fan. So I think that the Giants got a great GM, and the Giants got a great head coach. But that doesn't negate the systemic problem that's in the league. There's no doubt that Brian Dable is a qualified NFL head coach. But right. so is Brian Flores. Yeah, I, I think we've seen that, obviously. Here's my question, though, is in the future, because I, I think it's likely they might be able to prove, again, that the Giants didn't follow the Rooney rule to a T because Joe Schoen knew that the guy he wanted was the guy he'd already worked with in Buffalo, and he wanted Brian Dable to, as you say, be the qualified next head coach of the Giants. I think it's possible they might be able to prove that. But what, do you, what is the right thing in that situation? If you know already, because we see this in every walk of life, right, where people oftentimes gravitate to people they've already worked with, people they know are qualified and fit into the system or the scheme or the organizational structure of what they want to do, and that's the way they want to go. If they do that, I, I mean, do you... How do they make it better than this situation? I mean, obviously they brought him in, but the only thing that could flip it around is like if they brought in Flores the day before they brought in Dable for the interview. And I just, I, I'm struggling with the functionality of it. You know, like it, it all makes sense. We all want it to be that. But how do you functionally do that and make it not feel like it was just a token interview? You're right, and that's where this specific case may end up not being the strongest, but the least that they could have done. If the texts with Bill Belichick are absolutely true, then the least they could have done was not release the fact that they were about to hire Dable sure. days before they interviewed Flores. That's the least they could do, because then what you're basically saying is, yes, this interview with the minority candidate is just going to be a sham interview to check off the Rooney rule box. Yeah. No, I think that's absolutely it. So, Aaron, what do you think? It sounds like you don't think this is going to a settlement. You think this is going to play itself out. What do you think ultimately happens here with the NFL moving forward and with Brian Flores? I think that ultimately what's going to happen here is that the courts are going to put teeth in the Rooney rule and make it something more than the checking of boxes. And I think that the end result is going to be we're going to see better opportunities for black and other minority head coaches in the NFL. And some of the names that we've gotten off that list are actually going to get their own chance to become NFL head coaches and hopefully with an equal runway to the kinds that the white coaches have had in the past. Yeah. That's my hope, and I think that's what's going to happen with this case. Uh, we will certainly be watching. Interesting. By the way, I think the most damning thing in the entire deal, and again, I don't think it has anything to do with racism, but the part about Stephen Ross offering him $100,000 to lose games on purpose in the hopes of tanking for the number one seed, especially since Ross has interest in gambling companies <laughs> i mean <laughs> that one is the one that sort of to me is beyond the pale and and frankly again i don't know what it does for flores in this particular lawsuit but i think it could open up a whole bunch of problems for the nfl when it comes to gambling and their operations and business well i'll tell you one thing that it does for flores here the narrative that came out of that was that Flores was, quote-unquote, a poor communicator. It's very important that we look at the kinds of narratives created around these black coaches. Eric Bieniemy, who does not, has not been a head coach, he, the narrative that get, gets created around him is, well, you know, he doesn't call the plays. 
for the right. Kansas City Chiefs. Do you hear the same narrative about white offensive coordinators who don't call the plays? You don't. This is something that gets created uniquely around the enemy, and that's unfair. And the NFL has to watch the verbiage. They have to watch the way that their own league and their own personnel are described because it doesn't serve the game. Yeah, I think that's right. Although, to be fair, on the other side, Matt Nagy maybe didn't have that complaint, but he went to Chicago, and he was terrible, and he'll never be a head coach again in the league in the exact Agreed. same situation. So he got the opportunity, but he's done because he was awful, and that may be a red flag for the enemy, fairly or unfairly, because he's coming from the exact same situation. True. I'll give you the Which final word. Here. Ring. <laughs> yeah. But the final word here is we should watch this. It's long overdue. Somebody should have brought a suit like this years ago. Brian Flores is the right kind of person to bring this suit because he's very well respected in the league. And I think that he's going to assemble the kind of legal team that's necessary to give the NFL a real challenge here. It certainly seems like he means business. It is going to be really wild, I think, to watch how this unfolds and if it gets to discovery and if it gets to court and all of that. Aaron Solomon from Esquire Digital, we appreciate the time tonight and kind of helping us sort through what I, I think is going to be a very messy suit. Thanks for having me. Take care. All right. Thank you very much. Aaron Solomon, Chief Legal Analyst for Esquire Digital. And it is interesting to get into all of these details. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about it when we come back. I also want to get down some of the list of the coaches, some of the ones he talked about, by the way, because it's interesting when you look at it and you can skew it in a lot of different ways. And I'll try to illustrate that for you on the way back to one side and the other side and that gets to my point that I tried to get with Aaron as well is that I think it's very difficult when the very nature of hiring for your team to try to win at the highest level and ultimately win a Super Bowl is subjective that's why so many teams fail and have to do it over again right the very nature of it's subjective to try to attach objective requirements or criteria around it I think is very difficult. And I think it would be different depending on what team you are. You know, the Browns of four years ago are not the Patriots. And that, I think, is going to be a challenge. We'll talk about that when we come back. Also, our phone lines will be open. 737-7767 if you want to get on the conversation. We would welcome that as well. This is Sportsline on News Channel 5+. Plus.